Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's lore focused video, we'll be looking at everything we know about Enola's tattoo. So without further ado, let's try to solve the mysteries of this so-called map to dry land. To begin this story, we must first look to Waterworld's earliest inception, that being Peter Rader's original screenplay. In this early screenplay, which differs significantly from the final film, we are first introduced to Enola in a scene where she is swimming and collecting barnacles to eat. As she comes out of the water, Helen is quick to apply a flesh-colored powder to Enola's left shoulder in order to conceal a small tattoo of a crescent shape with a triangular neck out of the concave of its inner arc. They know it's a secret map that's yet to be figured out, a map to help the quote searchers find their way to dry land, or water's end as it's referred to in this early script. The original script also introduces us to two circular glass pendants, a small and a large one, that Helen and Enola wear around their necks for luck. It is revealed that these amulets were found in the same boat that Enola drifted to the atoll upon years earlier. Throughout the script, our companions are constantly losing and regaining these amulets, but in the end, these glass pendants become a pivotal tool in discovering water's end, so keep them in mind. Towards the conclusion of the original script, our companions find themselves aboard a large ship and encounter its sole inhabitant, Cornelius Funky, a mouse-like man who's sort of a cross between Old Gregor and the Smoker's human depth gauge. When Cornelius sees Enola's tattoo, he remarks that it looks like an eclipse, which triggers the Mariner, known as Morgan in this script, to have an epiphany. He realizes that when the earth moves between the sun and the moon, it creates a shadow on the moon, and the nick on the moon of Enola's tattoo is in fact a mountain on the surface of the earth, also projecting its own shadow on the moon. Morgan concludes that at the exact moment you can see the nick, you can take coordinates off the moon with a sextant to find the exact location of water's end. And while this is a very cool premise, there are many holes in logic when looking at it more closely. Cornelius uses an ancient almanac and six generations of calendar keeping, along with somehow knowing their exact location on Earth, to give the specific moment that the lunar eclipse will happen, which, according to the story, is conveniently in six hours. And while a lunar eclipse is a naturally occurring but rare episode in celestial movement, where a full moon moves directly into the shadow of the Earth, there is no way for our companions to know if the Earth will spin to the precise location for water's end to cast its shadow, since Earth is continuously rotating. A lunar eclipse only lasts two hours at the most, meaning that Earth will have only rotated 30 degrees of its full 360 degree rotation, rendering only a 1 in 12 chance that water's end will even have the likelihood of moving into the correct position. Not to even mention that the crescent shadow on the moon, which is only visible as the moon progresses through the penumbra, is extremely soft, and I don't think that one would even be able to make out elevated features on Earth in the given shadow, even with a high-powered telescope. But regardless, this premise creates a ticking clock element to the plot as Enola and Cornelius wait for the moment that they can see the shadow of water's end through a telescope that they fashioned from the two glass pendants, which were actually lenses, that Enola and Helen wore around their necks throughout the script. And at that exact moment that the shadow of water's end appears, Enola takes a reading of the moon with the sextant, all while the pirates are attacking and trying to board the ship. And I'm no expert in nautical navigation or the usage of sextants, but I don't think taking a measurement off the moon at the moment that Water's End casts a shadow would even give you directions to the fabled island. But if you know how to use a sextant, please let me know in the comments down below if there's any logic to this. In the end, the coordinates, 12 degrees above horizon, allow the gang to navigate their pontoon plane to Water's End by sunrise the next day. And yes, looking back on Enola's tattoo in the original screenplay, we realize how flawed the premise is, but it does set up what will be eventually presented in the final film, though even through subsequent rewrites, Enola's tattoo, as it's presented in the movie, has its own set of flaws. In the film, we are first introduced to the infamous back piece when aboard the atoll, as Enola wanders into the main area of the tavern trading post to find a fresh draw stick. 
The tattoo catches the attention of the Nord, who is a spy for the Smokers, who prior to this moment was questioning a hydroholic that told him, quote, if you read the marks on the child, they'll take you all the way to dry land. Helen quickly covers up the tattoo and directs Enola to the back of the shop. She knows the potential importance and danger of the markings and does not want to draw any unwanted attention to them. In the novel, when we are first introduced to Enola, she is described as looking Nepalese with darker skin, which is of course a hint of where Enola came from and where we will eventually end up at the conclusion of the story. Taking a closer look at Enola's tattoo, we find it's a solid black circle with an arrow in the middle pointing directly to a craggy mountain on top, surrounded by Chinese characters. But evidently, no one in the Atoll Society knows Chinese or is able to decipher these markings. So how do our companions translate these symbols? We will learn soon enough. Later on in Gregor's laboratory, the wily old inventor drives himself mad at his telescope trying to crack the code on Enola's back. In the extended and Ulysses cut of Waterworld, we are given his full monologue. From this monologue, we can see that Gregor is using his knowledge of geometry, astronomy, and astrology to try to decode the riddle on Enola's back, but to no avail. He is not even sure if it's a calendar or a map. Meanwhile, Helen is at the Atoll meeting where her fellow citizens are accusing Enola as being dangerous, having heard rumors that the smokers were looking for her. When she rejoins Gregor in the laboratory, she asks if he has solved the mystery of Enola's tattoo and that they need to leave soon before the Atollers turn on them. Enola suggests that the Mariner may know the answers to the riddle on her back. Helen is also convinced that the Mariner may know the way to dry land, because Helen had seen dirt as pure as that which the Mariner brought to the atoll before, that being the dirt she found in the basket that Enola washed up to the atoll upon. This convinces Helen that 1. Enola is originally from dry land, and 2. the Mariner knows the way to dry land. As we know, the Mariner has never found dry land, though he has sailed further than most have dreamed, and he reveals to Helen the source of his pure dirt, that being, the bottom of the ocean. However, in the novelization, it is also divulged that the Mariner, as he scavenges the ruins of the ancients, is also carefully charting the cities that he visits on a homemade map. Let's keep this in mind as it's another clue to decoding the mystery on Enola's back. Going back to earlier in our adventure, the Mariner, Helen, and Enola encounter a creepy drifter who offers the Mariner to trade time alone with Helen or Enola in exchange for a canister of paper. Now depending on what version of the film you're watching, it can be quite easy to miss the significance of the paper in the canister. Ultimately, the Mariner calls off the trade and kills the drifter, then takes what possessions of his he sees valuable, including the paper. Later on, after the Trimoran is torched by the Smokers, and the Mariner and Helen are rescued by Gregor and his dirigible, we can actually see that the Mariner chooses to bring the canister of paper along with him to New Oasis, the collection of boats that the refugees of the Atollers have fastened together. And that evening, aboard New Oasis, we can see Gregor studying the Drifter's paper, which appear to be the pages of a China airline magazine. Gregor scurries over to Helen to tell her that he has translated a sketch of Enola's tattoo that he still has. He tells her that the symbols are in fact numbers. But you're probably wondering, what do these Chinese characters actually translate to? Well, Crack.com in 2012 wrote an article titled, Five Cryptic Movie Tattoos They Didn't Think We'd Translate, which famously translated the tattoo and found that not only was the Chinese very rough and probably not written by a native speaker of the language, but that it actually had a Japanese character in place of one of the Chinese ones. Though I have to push back a little bit on this point and say that it may have been intentional as director Kevin Reynolds had the vision that in Waterworld all culture and language would be blended up together and combined, like the in-universe language of Portugreek, which is a combination of Portuguese and Greek. But regardless, Enola's tattoo translates roughly to Latitude, 86 degrees, 56 minutes Longitude, 27 degrees, 59 minutes so clearly we have coordinates to some location, but where exactly is that location on Earth? 
Well, we will learn this in a minute, but not without another revelation. In the book, when the Mariner returns to the ruins of the Trimoran after visiting New Oasis, he finds his handmade chart with all the underwater cities plotted on it. He then adds the city that him and Helen visited, that of course being Denver, Colorado, and suddenly an epiphany. It becomes clear to him why his handmade chart never matched another land days chart that he had salvaged from the sea. The poles of these maps were opposites of each other. Placing his handmade chart upside down over the ancient chart, all of the dots indicating the individual cities suddenly lined up, and the mariner had his next important clue to cracking the riddle of Enola's tattoo. But it should be mentioned that the whole mariner charting the underwater cities of Waterworld subplot is almost completely cut from all versions of the film. However, in the film, the mariner does find the drawings that Enola has scrolled on the back of the charts, things like horses which are of course called back to at the end of the film. This detail about Enola's drawings on the back of the charts is also in the book, so I do suspect that the mariner's homemade map subplot was probably filmed and just no longer exists. And in fact, Enola's visions of dry land that he finds in the burnt out remains of the Trimoran convince the hardened mariner that Enola is indeed from dry land and that he needs to go back and save his friend. So once again, the mariner returns to New Oasis on the eastern banks where he meets with Gregor again who has determined that the tattooed numbers are in fact longitude and latitude, an ancient form of geographic location. But Gregor can't make any sense of it, and he feels the numbers are somehow backwards. At this, the Mariner informs him that he has discovered the world is upside down, that the poles have reversed themselves according to his maps. And I would just like to pause here for a minute and ask the question, can the Earth's poles actually reverse themselves? Well, in fact, yes, they can. It's actually a natural phenomenon called geomagnetic reversal which occurs when the planet's magnetic north and south are interchanged. Scientists actually believe this has occurred seemingly spontaneously 183 times over the past 83 million years. The transition between full reversals can vary greatly from 1000 to 10,000 years with some estimates even as quick as a human lifetime. But what causes these events to happen? Well, it's not known for sure, but scientists have several different theories. They believe that the reversals are triggered by events that directly disrupt the flow of the Earth's core, or dynamo action, which generates the planet's magnetic fields. A possible internal event is plate tectonics colliding and creating subduction zones, or plate tectonics separating at divergent boundaries and creating new mantle plumes. In either case, the core mantle boundary is disrupted and in turn the magnetic fields. Other scientists speculate that an external impact event, like a meteorite striking Earth, could potentially disrupt the Earth's dynamo action too. And I have a strong feeling that we'll be revisiting this idea in a future video on the Great Deluge and how the world became flooded to form Waterworld. But regardless of how, the magnetic poles of Waterworld are reversed and this causes Gregor to have his final epiphany at the conclusion of the film. Meanwhile, Enola is captured aboard the Dees where she tells the Deacon that her tattoo shows the way to dry land, but the Deacon nor any of his gang are able to decode its meaning. The Doc suggests that they cut it off her back, mount it, and stretch it to get a better look. Ultimately, it doesn't matter though since the Deacon just chooses to use Enola as a religious icon in order to keep his smoker army loyal and motivated to his cause. And I really like that in the book, as the Mariner emerges on the deck of the Dees, he simply suggests that the Deacon copy down the map on Enola's back and let them go on their way. Of course, this does not happen and things get more complicated. After the Dees has sank and the Deacon has been defeated, as Gregor is pulling Enola aboard the dirigible after the Mariner's bungee rescue, he catches a glimpse of Enola's tattoo upside down and realizes that to reach dry land he needs to reverse the coordinates on Enola's back so that north is south and south is north. He pulls out a map and a sextant and explains that this tool uses the angle of the sun to determine where they are on the map. After taking some very quick bearings, Gregor determines the direction to dry land. 
According to the book, our companions fly for multiple days aboard the dirigible before descending from the clouds and finally arriving at the fabled dry land. Their paradise had been found. The gang explores their new surroundings and finds a small village of huts. Entering one of the huts, they find the skeletal remains of what I believe is implied to be Enola's parents. In the novelization, the bones are described as being blackened by disease, leading us to believe that Enola's parents must have known they were dying and sent her out to sea in a basket as a last-ditch effort of survival. And interestingly, in Peter Rader's script that we discussed at the beginning of this video, there's a whole subplot about a disease called Blackbone, and so this small detail in the novelization must be a holdover from Rader's original script. And beside the skeletons are sketches of Enola's tattoo, along with a tattooing needle, leading us to believe that this is the very place that the image was inked onto Enola's back. And this makes me wonder, since Enola was a baby when she received the tattoo, did they have to make the tattoo very small so they would stretch when she grew into a girl? Also, what are the logistics of tattooing a baby in the first place? It just seems cruel when you think about it. But regardless, as the Mariner is departing from dry land, we are given one last reveal. Dry land is in fact the top of Mount Everest which is confirmed by the fact that Helen and Enola find the plaque commemorating Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay as the first to ascend to the summit of the mountain. So you're probably wondering, are the coordinates in Chinese on Enola's back the same as Mount Everest's coordinates in present day? Well, sort of, but this also has its own set of flaws. The first problem is that the coordinates on her back do not determine if they are north, south, east, or west, meaning that the coordinates could fall in any one of Earth's four hemispheres. But ignoring the exclusion of the cardinal directions, the numerical coordinates of latitude 86 degrees 56 minutes and longitude 27 degrees 59 minutes is actually a fairly accurate location near or on Mount Everest, but only with one big problem. Latitude and longitude are reversed. And while this was likely intentional by the filmmakers because of the reversed pole subplot, it does not make sense when you take a closer look, because only the north and south poles have reversed, meaning only latitude, the position north and south of the equator, would have been affected, and swapping north and south for east and west just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So looking at all of this information from the original script to the novelization to the various cuts of the film, we have one of the biggest cases of movie logic ever conceived. Everything about the mysteries of Enola's tattoo looks fine at first glance, but upon closer examination, you can see that it really doesn't hold up to real world logic. But that is so much the case with just about everything in Waterworld, so for us true fans, I think these inconsistencies are just part of the film universe's unique charm. But before we go, let's have a look at how Enola's tattoo came to be from a film production standpoint. Based of course on Peter Rader's original idea, the design evolved with the story, and it was director Kevin Reynolds himself who really came up with the final look and presented it on a 4x5 card to illustrator Stefan Deschamps and production designer Dennis Gastner who finalized the design. Makeup artist Fred Blau, who had experience creating tattoos for film, developed a stencil from the design and thickened the lines so that they would register better on camera. The design was duplicated onto silkscreen, from which hundreds of newspaper stencils were made. The stencils were transferred onto Tina Majorino's back with alcohol in a manner very much like children's temporary tattoos are applied. And if you are at all familiar with Waterworld, you will of course know that the tattoo design found its way into just about every piece of Waterworld merchandise and promotional material. From the video game to the board game, from the movie poster to the home videos, from the soft goods to the hard goods, the design, or a stripped down version of the design without the Chinese characters, can be spotted almost everywhere within Waterworld lore and collecting. And really the design, however flawed with movie logic, has really permeated itself into the overall aesthetic of Waterworld and is really synonymous with the film itself. And I have even thought about getting a version of the design tattooed on myself but that will have to be a topic for another day. So that is where I'm going to end this video. 
I've been wanting to tackle this topic of Enola's tattoo for some time now, so I'm very happy to have presented everything we know about it here. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know in the comments down below and give it a thumbs up so that it gets recommended to more viewers. If you're new to the channel, I would greatly appreciate your subscription as well. We are currently closing in on 1,000 subscribers and I would love to have you part of this channel's continued success. And follow the Atoll on Instagram for even more Waterworld content, link in the description below. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the Atoll.